Hi, I'm Matthew Francis. Welcome to End the Stigma. So I'm continuing this series because I got so much positive re uh, results. And um, the other thing is that Brandon had been on my show. He had been on my second show and people loved him. They wanted to hear more about his story. They were really intrigued by the way he answered questions. So he's someone who struggled with mental illness in the past, but for him, uh, he feels that he's overcome these mental health challenges and even transformed them to create meaning out of that. He now uh, has a thriving spiritual advising business, uh, online mostly it looks like. He does all sorts of good stuff uh, and he's going to tell you about that. Um, and what is exciting to me is that he's really bucking this paradigm that once you have a mental illness, you always have a mental illness. I, um, I'm really excited by that because we now know that mental illness isn't just managed anymore that there are a significant amount of the population that completely overcomes it um, so we're gonna hear from someone who feels he totally transformed it Brandon thank you for being here thanks um, for having me here my very first question is always uh, please introduce yourself give us some the viewers some background on your mental health conditions that you struggled with and then we'll go into depth more into you know okay so uh, my name is Brandon Densmore and basically I'm a spiritual guide and an intuitive life transformer. Okay. And I also do business consult uh, business consultation. Nice. Um, so the conditions I struggled with, the condition I've struggled with is really I like to call it being human. I've struggled with being human. Okay. <laughs> and I think that uh, a lot of people can identify with that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that my struggles are somehow a disease. Mm -hmm or a disorder even, because well, I've been able to gather strength from those issues and situations and struggles. Well, let's get more into that, but for, <coughs> for the purposes of the viewers, what conditions were you diagnosed with? I was diagnosed with bipolar, okay. depression, anxiety, PTSD. So a lot of similar ones that, I, that I've had as well. So talk to, talk to people, how did you overcome, how do you not see those as mental illnesses? Well, I see the whole, <clears throat> like the word mental illness. Mm. I took a training called, um, it was peer support training uh, by the state um, with Kelly and Catherine. Okay. And in that training, we were talking about language and how there's a medical language, like a clinical language, mm -hmm. and that we can become trapped by that language. We're very limited by our words. Absolutely. Or, or empowered. Right. Right. Exactly. It's almost like our words create our reality. Yes. And I was listening to you talking earlier about um, the story that we tell ourselves. So it's like that I, the, the word mental illness itself is part of a medical clinical language that oftentimes holds us down from reaching our true potential. Mm, mm, I see what you mean. But I see where you're going with that. So I've kind of a bit, like tried to abandon really yep. that kind of a term even in my own identity. It's true. Psychology. When you call it an illness, it just assumes by default there's something wrong. Exactly. So how do you frame it in your mind? Being human. Okay. So when I look back at all of the symptoms, and all of the, the situations and the ways that I was reacting to situations. It was fear. Mm -hmm. It was self-doubt, mm -hmm. self-criticism, not having faith in myself and in a higher power, mm -hmm. and um, dysfunctional relationships. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as a human experience. I mean, isn't it kind of normal to have fear I think it is. I think you're on something groundbreaking because of fear. Are you saying basically fear is behind most of the majority of I these think conditions? So. Okay. I think so. Talk a little bit more about that then. How did you overcome your fear? Um, it's been a process. Mm -hmm. um, getting outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. like Really stretching yourself. Stretching myself, doing things that make me uncomfortable, putting myself in situations that I've never been in. Mm -hmm. um, confronting my different ideas that I had of myself, like trying to figure out why am I having this fear about something? Do, is it coming from me thinking that I'm not good enough? Mm -hmm. 
So you just continuously unpacking, it sounds like. Continuously unpacking and then doing the opposite. Okay. I agree with that. Sort of feel the fear and then do it anyway. Isn't mm -hmm. that a, an expression? Feel the fear, do it anyways. And I would almost say, so if you're anxious, plow through it. You're not going to spontaneously combust. <laughs> you know, I mean, even though it might feel like it, it might feel like you're going to, but you're you're going to survive it. You know, um, so talk more about that. About the fear. Yeah, yeah. How you over, or your process. Yeah. Well, it's I still experience fear. Sure. I'm sure. afraid right now to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but yet I'm here doing this. Yeah. And as I practice and develop my skills, and I the fear eventually subsides and goes away. Yep. It does subside, doesn't it? It does. And then some things we fear, let's just talk about that. So some things we fear, we want people's approval. Mm -hmm. So we fear disapproval. Um, and why is that so important in your mind that we want, I mean, that we will give up who we are to seek someone else's approval? Why? Yeah. I think that it comes from our social programming. So <clears throat> it's like, we're. have you ever seen the movie The Matrix? Oh, so many years ago, yeah. It's yeah. kind of like we're born into... Um, a culture and a world that surrounds us and we're kind of trained to be dependent on everybody for everything for our spiritual authority mm -hmm. for our medical knowledge for our you know issues about money and all everything we're looking for other people's opinions and instead of trying to figure it out ourselves so how is the balance, though? Because I think from a survival point, we do need other people. Yes. And, you know, you might have a skill set that I don't have, mm -hmm. so it's okay to learn from you. Um, but then somehow it gets sort of morphed into a dysfunctional. Yes. So t talk about that a bit. So part of it is normal. I yeah. think like as evolutionary as, speaking exactly yeah. like yeah. as children, we need our parents. Absolutely. So there's a certain legitimacy to dependency. Yeah. yeah. But we it's like we don't grow up from being dependent into independent. You know something, I've been toying with this, I don't know what you, because you're a spiritual advisor. I sometimes feel um, Christianity is at fault for this. It talks a lot about being children. And I think of the prodigal son example, and we all identify as the children, and no one ever wants to be the father. You know what I mean? At what point do you put away childish things and become the adult? Do you know where, where I'm going with that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, it's like we're dependent on everything. Mm -hmm. So we never learn to be in independent and properly healthy interdependence. Exactly. Okay. So I look at it kind of like a staging process okay. from going from dependency as a child, then to independency as a young adult, independent, and then to interdependent. And so you feel that being labeled with a mental illness disrupts that process, that growth? Yes. Okay. Go into that a little bit. So when you're labeled with a mental illness, now you are... A perpetual child. Right. Yes, exactly. Yes, I see. Go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good student. <laughs> yeah, so you're basically a perpetual child. You are always deferring to someone else's opinion. Their expertise. Yes, yes. and um, you never can really get to the root of the problem and confront your fears about things because you're always kind of distracted. Okay. And the labels in some ways would keep you from your authentic self because you're going to see yourself through that lens. But there is a, a place for um, acknowledging in some instances that you have a mental health and you need some help. But it's, it's a struggle to navigate. Um, Could I make a comment on yeah, that? Absolutely. So <clears throat> think about this. So someone is has anxiety and then they don't need the medical solution because they kind of figure out how to deal with it on their own. Mm -hmm. Other people, right, have anxiety to the point where they have to seek medical attention, mm -hmm. right? Well, if it's debilitating, absolutely, sure. But what happens when we replace the word anxiety with fear? One person has fear and is able to get over it. Mm -hmm. The other person has fear and seeks medical attention. Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of degree or is all fear the same? Well, everything's on a spectrum, so it has to be a matter of degree. Um, 
I like to pick on anxiety a little bit because I feel like everyone's anxious. Like that's just sort of the buzz term going around. And I am picking on pharmaceutical companies. I think they have a vested interest in it. Um, and you know, benzos are usually the go-to. Um, they're very addictive. And they even disrupt the learning process. I've mm -hmm. learned that. Um, they disrupt the learning process so you can get very dependent on that psychologically and physically addicted <clears throat> to these medicines and then never really properly learn how to manage anxiety, mm -hmm. which is really what it is. It's like we all have a certain amount of fear or anxiety, whatever you want to call it. Um, which is normal and natural. It's normal and natural. Um, and then you hopefully learn some coping skills to go through it. But if you, if you keep defaulting on medicine, um, you're never going to learn to do, you're never going to. It's just going to be a self-perpetrating thing. Mm -hmm. I have a joke. Five minutes of meditation a day keeps the benzos away. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little statement I have. but Yeah, I could see how that's very true. Yeah. Do you practice any, what holistic practices do you do? Um, I practice uh, meditation, mm -hmm. definitely prayer. Um, Is that different for you, prayer versus meditation? Mm. Sort of, um, but I've kind of turned almost my whole, like everything that I do into a kind of prayer. So you're living your prayer. And meditation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, even washing the dishes yep. or taking out the trash. It's a real discipline. It is. To be in the moment, to mm. be present, fully present. And I have to be vigilant and aware yeah. of my feelings and yep. thoughts and, and so that I can catch things as they're happening mm -hmm. and replace them with something else. Mm -hmm. I know people talk about going to the breath, we're always returning to the breath. If, and, and for some people, that's not their favorite thing. But I would just say, even if it's not the breath, something physical, you know, be aware of your surroundings on a physical, mm -hmm. whatever your touch, like your feet or your sitting, um, or, or be aware of sound or of something visual. So it doesn't always have to be breath if that's off-putting. But for me, uh, prayer was different than meditation. Prayer to me was... Uh, uh, for me, it's a relationship with Jesus. It was talking. It was being in the presence of the Lord. Whereas meditating for me is, a, is the discipline of being present, being mindful. So like in the moment, yes, in the now? Yes, yes, yes. That makes sense. Okay. It's a good distinction. Yes. So let me see. I have other questions. Um, do you, how, okay, we've talked a lot about this. Is there something, though, I didn't ask you you wanted to, to elaborate on? Um. I don't think so. Um, you wanted to say hi to somebody. Oh, I wanted to say hi to my mom. Okay. Melody Densmore. Okay. And to Mary Marcel, she's my wife. Okay. And um, that I have a uh, Facebook group called Spiritual Awakening for the Recovery World. Mm -hmm. Talk more about the recovery, because that's, that's a real buzzword now, too. Yes. Is it, what model do you use when you do recovery? Are you using 12 steps as a model? Uh, well, I've created my own eight-week program. Okay. So during each week covers a different topic, and I've kind of created my own system to help people get from where they are now mm -hmm. to where they want to be. So talk a little bit about that. Give an infomercial, so to speak. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so my program, it's called Embodying Spiritual Power, mm -hmm. and um, it's basically the quickest way to gain clarity on your unique divine purpose to gain lasting peace and satisfaction all while mastering the metaphysical laws of the universe so is it similar to laws of attraction um i not really okay um but similar in the sense that we do discuss spiritual law yep and how the dynamics of the universe work there there are principles of the way the world works and when we accept that we're a lot happier you know, we can we can sit there and, and, you know, I don't like water, I can't stand it, but we need it, you know what I mean? Or the, the, the earth is round, whether we like it or not, you know what I mean? And I feel like if we obey the laws of spiritual spirituality, uh, we're just happier, you know? But we sometimes do need guidance as to what that is. In eight weeks, interestingly enough, is we're starting to realize that that's the amount of time it takes to change a habit. It, it's eight weeks. So that's a perfect amount of that's time. That's what we're for shooting you. for. Is that what you're shooting for to change? Yeah, change the way you see things. So. Yeah, and um, basically, I've come from rock bottom. Mm -hmm. I've come from rock bottom with mental health issues, and subs addiction, substance abuse, um, trauma, both sexual and physical, mm -hmm. and I was devastated and lost. 
and now I'm an online entrepreneur and I'm helping people all over the world. That's got to feel good. It's like you can create almost an alternate timeline mm -hmm. where you're no longer going down the path that you were going down and you become a completely different person. Yep. That's awesome. And trauma, you know, is stifling, uh, but it doesn't have to, be, you know, we do not have to be what happened to us. We have some choices in that. Um, I believe it's important to acknowledge our feelings, uh, but then get beyond that. Mm. You know, feelings aren't everything. They're guidance. They don't have to be, and feelings can be altered. We can alter the way we feel. So. Yeah, and they're part of being human. Yes, yes. So they're natural, but it's what kind of life do we really want to live? Right. Do I want to be someone who's scared, someone who's unhappy, someone right. who's unfulfilled, someone who's lost? No. It doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. So that means I have to sacrifice those things mm -hmm. and try something different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those things, though, uh, work in the short term. Being miserable, you get your needs met, maybe people feel sorry for you, or you can get you know, people to agree with your point of view, but it's not satisfying. It's sort of like eating junk food as opposed to eating a nice, healthy, nutritious meal. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I liked what you were saying earlier about um, how you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So a lot of the most powerful spiritual lessons that we learn come out of our traumas and they come yep. out of our sufferings. While we're experiencing the trauma and suffering, Doesn't we don't know like that. It. Yeah, right. It's only in retrospect. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is to, if a challenge confronts me in the moment, to have faith enough, the belief that, that something good is going to come out of it no matter what. Yep. And that really helps relieve my anxiety. And something that's helped me, as I mentioned, in my, is being okay with not understanding everything. You know, maybe in this lifetime it's not all going to come together and make sense. And I'm okay with that. You know, so that helps me. So, yeah, it's like we're completely sufficient. We are as not self-sufficient in the sense that we don't need anyone else, but in some ways we don't. I, I mean, we do, but we can get what we need within ourselves. We can get validated within ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can uh, remind ourselves that we're good people. So if someone craps on you, that's not a reflection of who you are. It's a reflection of who they are. <laughs> you that's know what right. I mean? It that doesn't belong to you. Give it back to them. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful interview. Um, so, uh, viewers, thank you for tuning in. I hope that you really enjoyed Brandon's interview. He's come a long way. He's gone through a lot. And I hope that uh, End the Stigma just really helps demystify mental illness, uh, rather mental health. And that you know, no matter who you are, you can get there. You can get there. You can be who you want to be. Um, and you're a good person no matter what you're going through. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next month.